we're recording now. I'll give Dorothy a call and see if I can get her, get a hold of her. Okay. Um, so I'm going to call the Finance Committee meeting of June 10th, 2021 to order at five minutes after two o'clock. And uh, I want to uh, thank everybody for being here. This is a virtual meeting uh, and it's uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's order of March 12, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, chapter 30, section 18. Uh, and I will note for the entire committee's sake that uh, the governor's order is ending as of 12.01 a.m. on June 15th from my recollection of what his latest uh, announcement was which means that if the legislature doesn't do anything to amend the open meeting law, which is a um, legislation under consideration, this would be our last virtual meeting and we would uh, need to start scheduling our meetings as in-person meetings if um, the order, um, if the legislature amends uh, the um, open meeting law to allow uh, a lo longer period to segue from uh, virtual meetings to in-person meetings, then we will uh, be able to continue for a little bit longer. So I just want to have you be able to be prepared. Um, so I think that what I'm going to do is go through the um, committee list and just uh, do the usual requirement under the open meeting law and ask each of you is a um, ask for your recognition. I do see the Dorothy's here now. So we've got the full complement of committee present to acknowledge, as I say, as I uh, ask that you can uh, hear by and when you respond below. So Pat DeAngelis. Present. And Dorothy Pam. Present. Uh, Bob Hegner. Present. <coughs> Bernie Kubiak. Present. Jane Schaffler. <coughs> Jane. I'm not hearing you, so I can't confirm. I'm going to come back. Can you, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Great. Okay, Thank I'm you. here. <laughs> okay, so we'll notify that. I have Lynn Reeser. Present. And uh, Kathy Shane. I'm here. So I think that I have acknowledged all members of the committee and everybody is present. And uh, the agenda is um, on the screen for a moment. And uh, Michelle Miller is in the attendees. And I am going to ask that um, she be um, brought into the meeting along with the members of the committee and staff who are present because I want her to be part of the meeting for the present for the discussion of the first item that you see listed um below um, at that point um if there is anybody in the pub in the in the attendee list um it, it, i will see if there's a uh, request for public comment and then proceed um and unless requested by um staff or a member of the committee just shuffle the order i'm going to um just go with the order as it has been posted in the agenda. So um, with that, uh, Michelle, has Michelle been added? I'm here, yep. Okay, great, thank you. So I'm mean, gonna, I think, um, ask uh, either Sean or Paul to, start us off on the discussion of the reparations coalition 
there are two parts to it. Uh, really, it, as was presented, was the committee charge and um, further uh, discussion of the uh, process that we talked about at our last meeting for how reparations funding can work. So uh, who, which one of you is going to start? Paul, are you? So I'd like to say a few words and then hand it off to Sean. And so and you, you have a memo in your packet that we just got to you this morning. So apologize for the lateness of it, but it's just working on th lots of different things right now. Um, and this is to identify, uh, you know, the, the council said we want, you, we want the finance community to give us advice on how we can establish a fund and a, a revenue stream for reparations if the council were to go in that direction. Um, and so, you know, our finance team put their thinking hats on and came up with a, a very creative way of addressing this that does not impact our operating budgets, but addresses the concern. And I just, and I give credit to Sean and Sonia for doing the creative of way of like, I love having them part of the problem, prob the problem solving and say, okay, we have a, we have a goal of the council. Let's see how we can make it happen. So I'm going to turn it over to Sean because it's, it, it was, it was their ideas. So credit to them. Thanks, Paul. Um, Athena, can you bring up the memo? It might be best just to kind of walk through that. So um, yeah, so this first piece is essentially just um, reflecting what we had discussed at the, at the previous meeting which was uh, first to establish a reparation stabilization fund, which require a two thirds vote of the council. Um, and there's a, a motion attached um, that was part of the packet as well that lays out one way to do that. And then the second piece was to transfer, it might've been 206, I just rounded up to, to 210,000 um, from, from whenever we do the free cash transfer in FY22, that 210,000 would be transferred into this reparation stabilization fund. Um, so those are sort of the immediate next steps related to this, that um, the stabilization fund could be approved at any time and the, and the 210,000, um, if we want to keep it uh, sort of our normal process of when we transfer free cash would, would most likely be done in the fall. Um, so that's part one. Part two, um, we were thinking this is something if the council desires could be um, continued in the future. Um, uh, we could talk about, you know, Every time we do a free cash transfer, does a certain percentage, instead of going into our normal stabilization fund reserve, does a certain percentage go into the reserve for reparations? Um, we've, you know, when we look back, we can look at sort of what our history is with free cash transfers. And um, we don't make them every year, but at least in the last five years, we make them in most years. Um, free cash is generated whenever we have an operating budget surplus, or if um, that, that will tend to increase free cash. And when we uh, sometimes council will appropriate things out of free cash if there's an emergency expense of some sort. Um, but typically we will look at free cash in the fall and if, and if we're above 5% of our operating budget, that difference is transferred um, to a different place. Um, again, in the past, it's been our, our stabilization reserve fund. Um, so we, look, we think this could be a viable um, option for funding reparations in the future. Um, and then the, the sort of wrinkle that you'll see in this memo is we really were trying to think how do we, um, we one, we want to, you know, we're thinking how do we build the fund over time and make continuing contributions. Um, but then two, how do we make sure the fund is um, sustainable and it's not, you know, we make a contribution one year and it's all used, but then there's nothing the next year. Um, so we were thinking about managing, you know, one idea would be to manage the fund like you would do an endowment um, where we keep making contributions and there's a certain percentage that is allocated towards expenditures each year. Um, and as you grow the fund through investing it and through additional contributions, that percentage that can be spent grows each year. Um, and, you, and then it allows it to be a more sustainable, predictable amount that can be spent on reparations each year going forward. Um, and hopefully in perpetuity would be, the, would be the goal to set something up that can last on for a long, long time. And I think that's pretty much it, that's sort of our initial thought around this um, as one way we could set this up um, and you know try to make it as impactful as possible. Okay, well, thank you. 
So I have a couple things that I was going to just say. One is that in the Finance Committee report that was sent to the last council meeting, which I shared with the entire committee, uh, uh, the uh, piece that I added right at the end, uh, late at night on deadline day, was um, a brief description toward, at the very end of the report about the um, preparations uh, propo fund proposal. And I misstated um, the question of how the uh, 200, I think it was 206,000 at that point, it's now been rounded uh, for this memo, was derived at and uh, I uh, realized uh, by the next morning uh, that uh, I had made the deadline, but I had made a mistake on that one point by stating that it was related to a calculation of prior year's transfers as opposed to uh, based upon uh, just sort of also knowing what the uh, initial marijuana tax revenue might be in using that as base for the first transfer, though it was never discussed as the amount. So that um, Sean came up with uh, what should have been an amended language and I made that as a verbal part of my report to the council when the council met. Um, so that's point one. Point two is that uh, you know, the amount that we're going to transfer each year is something that I think that the Finance Committee is going to have to determine whether it's appropriate and then it's ultimately going to be require a council vote to make the transfer. So, uh, you know, it will be a year for year decision that's going to be made by whoever's on the Finance Committee and Council at the time. Uh, Point three, I think, is fairly obvious that uh, from the memo also that uh, the transfers from the fund for actual um, use for um, purposes of reparation and uh, trying to move in, uh, to, to achieve the goals that are behind the whole proposal um, will also require council vote, and uh, but uh, I think that uh, that gets to the last point, which is that um, there's been thought given to a committee uh, to come forward with recommendations on on that, and uh, I don't know if uh, either Paul or Michelle wants to say anything about that, but. The, the committee would have to be um, also created as a part of this process. Um, so I think that that's uh, kind of a brief summary of all of the points that I would add, uh, just want to make. So um, I see that Dorothy, you have your hand up and Pat and Kathy. So uh, Dorothy, just going in order. All right. So. Um I'm saying on first hearing, I like this idea in that um, this, as I've been told, is how wealth is built up. Um, money put aside where the principal isn't really touched most of the time and interest is built. So that, you know, this is a problem that took a long time making and it could take um, a little time solving. So that sounds good to me theoretically. But what I, I lack sometimes the financial imagination. Um, at the rate, let's pretend that we did this for 10 years, Sean, at about um, uh, 210,000 a year. So in 10 years time, what kind of income could this fund generate? Because that's, I know I did these problems in math in school, but they didn't mean anything to me then. I don't know how to do them now. Um, so what kind of income could it generate? I like the idea that this is a form of stability and might not be subject to the whim of who's on the council, who's not on the council, what's happening, but could be a kind of a steady source. But I just don't have any idea of the size of it in 10 years. Yeah, I mean, so um, a couple of things. Um, I think one decision would have to be made at, for FY23, again, what percentage um, of the free cash transfer would 
um, go into this fund. Sometimes those free cash transfers are over a million dollars. Um, sometimes it's, you know, maybe only a few hundred thousand dollars. There's been, you know, it seems like more um, rarely we don't have one, but in most cases, it's a significant amount that is transferred to free cash. Um, you know, one thought we had is we'd want to consider what our reserves are at the time. Um, if our reserves are high, like they are now, um, that might be where we do a, a greater percentage to the um, to this fund. If mm -hmm. our reserves were low, if something happened, you know, uh, economic downturn and, and our reserves were under 5% or under 10% of the operating budget, then maybe that percentage would sort of, there'd be some sort of mechanism for it to scale down a little bit until we got our, res our regular reserves back to where they need to go. Um, and, you know, the way I would think about it is, so let's say you did 200,000 for five years, you'd get up to a million. Um, if the draw rate was 4%, which is 4%, you know, that percentage could adjust a little bit, but that's sort of the percentage that mm -hmm. when you think, um, like I think the Jones library uses four to four, five, uh, maybe it's four and a half now or something like that, that they use, um, that would translate to about $40,000 a year, sustainably $40,000 a year that could, um, be used for reparation payments or reparation expended purposes. Um, and again, as you grow that million, you know, every million, it'd be another 40,000, um, that could kind of that could go towards that purpose in a, in a sustainable, ongoing way. Thank you very much. Pat? Thank you. I have a, um, a small question. Um, if this were an endowment fund, would uh, the public be able to make direct donations to it um, and feed the fund in that way, in yeah, addition no, to what right. we put in as a town? Right, that's a great question. I we think so. We that's one of the things we want to double check with um, uh, with legal counsel. I believe somebody could donate for that purpose, um, but we want to confirm that um, uh, that, that that there's no issues with it. But I think so. Great. The other the other kind of question I have uh, in the proposal for the uh, um, African Heritage Reparations Coalition. There is a committee primarily of black uh, residents who are making the decision about how that's spent. How does that interact with the council? Because all of a sudden it sounded to me like the council was going to say what could be um, pay, uh, given out. Or, right. or how it could be directed. So could you clarify that for me? Yeah, so, so I think technically the council in, uh, with a stabilization fund, um, the council will always have to be that final approval piece because it's town funds. Um, but we were thinking that the com that, um, that committee or if there was a different committee set up that, that had a similar purpose, that that committee would be sort of the advisory of how the funds were spent. Okay. Um, and I imagine, I, you know, I don't wanna, I can't say with certainty, but I imagine that obviously how they, um, you know, the, the purposes that they identified, as long as they were legally allowable purposes would be strongly considered um, by the council at the time. Okay, I'd just you. like to, I'd like to jump in here also, because I think it's an important point to recognize that this, these are still town funds. We still are a governmental yeah. operation. We have to follow procurement laws. We have to follow, um, you know, we, we can only spend things on legally permissible things, but and, and the other thing is that the only way to take funds out of the stabilization fund is by a two thirds vote of the town council. There's no other ways to get out. So the council has to have a role in it. Right. So, and one, just to build on that, one reason why we're proposing the stabilization fund now is because we haven't gotten all the legal answers on this yet. Um, so we can, you know, we can start working on it and building up a fund. Um, but if for whatever reason, something happened where it was deemed that we, you know, it was so legally limited what we could do that it, um, it didn't make sense to do it this way. Um, those stabilization funds, I believe, can be closed back out um, uh, to where they came from, essentially, okay. which would be free cash or our regular stabilization fund. Thank you. Kathy. The answer some of what I was going to ask. Um, I was looking at this memo and the allocation interactively with the charge and the charge the way and I know it's not our role to write the charge but the charge has in it um, as it's come out that the committee that's being set up would uh, develop a plan for a reparation fund and then a process for allocating and it seems like the plan for setting up the fund is going to come out of finance in the town 
and then the recommendations for the possible ways that the fund could be spent would come out of the committee was my understanding, you know, so that we have this uh, stabilization fund to be used for the following once we figure out what the purposes are. Um, so I didn't know whether we need to uh, just double check the wording of the charge. Um, you know, because of everything you just said that we're going to have to check with legal on which things can be done, but also the decision on a initial seeding of money, which we were being asked to do uh, a recommendation for FY22. We don't know yet what FY23 might be. So the external committee, I don't think would be the one saying we recommend you do another 200,000 next year. So it, it's just trying to figure out how this works, the funding of it, not the spending of it, um, end of it, just to make sure we've worded those both correctly. And then my, my last, so that's sort of a comment question. And the last is um, when we did the percent for art bylaw, we did a little clause in it that said, if economic circumstances, if the town budget, if something else meant that we were tight for funds, uh, we wouldn't, you could either not go all the way or, or not do some of this. So, so I'm not, so I'm not again talking about FY22, but I'm just wanting to figure out a wording that doesn't say every year we'd always do even X percent because there might be some years on excess cash that for the cash flow that there was an emergency need for it. And I know we've built up reserves, but we're about to have all these big buildings start to pull on our reserves. So I just, so that's again, and, and is that in the charge? Is that in the way we set it up at the first place, but just sort of the future commitment beyond the year, having some kind of soft wording like that. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's, I think there's a benefit to having a plan and knowing that that plan can always be um, sort of year to year tweaked because by whoever's on the council at the time. Um, but I think there's definitely a benefit of having a plan. Um, we were, again, thinking that, you know, part of that plan would be some, you know, tiers of, you know, what percentage it is based on kind of the fiscal health of the town at the time um, to kind of a, acknowledge what you just mentioned, which there may be some times where the town's not in a good position to do it. Um, but I do think it's important to kind of have that planned for the ongoing piece of this, um, if it's going to be successful. And just the, just one other comment on the 4% draw. A 4% draw is, of course, always possible. You can just decide you do it. If you're not trying to pull down the endowment, that means it's got to earn at least 4%. Right. And, and, you know, so, so there needs to be a general, however we talk about this publicly without getting technical, is that a 4% draw could actually deplete the fund if it couldn't grow. And that's, we, we have no control over that other than trying to be wise investors. Um, so yeah no again this is very early stages with this sort of idea it was more i think we wanted to get your input to see if this is an idea yeah. that you would want us to look into further um again that we would this type of fund would be managed differently than other types of funds this you know this type of fund would be managed like a long-term um investment where you generally do get returns over the four percent um but you're right on a on a year-to-year -year basis you know if it's a down year it could be under four percent but um but between the investment returns and potentially ongoing contributions, um, the hope would be that you don't deplete, you know, however much is in there the year before, it doesn't go below that. I didn't, as I said, I didn't want to get technical, but just it's in how we phrase, frame, describe what we've done. I like this idea, you know, I'm not saying I don't like the idea or I'm not supportive. I just want to um, avoid over-promising, but at the same time, make a commitment. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see if we can come to a conclusion on this uh, later in the process, but I'm going to continue on recognizing people who have asked to be recognized. Lynn? Yes, thank you. Um, 
first of all, I'm thank you for the memo. I think this moves us in the right direction for very important reasons. Um, I um, have a couple questions, but I want to start out by saying to me, this would be like establishing the Jones Library Fund. And it becomes a fund in which either the library or individuals or individual states or whatever can contribute to. And then decisions have to be made by the town as to whether we do use passive or active invest, uh, investment to grow the fund as well. Um, and then, you know, in the library fund, if you look at it, they, you know, they vary how much they can draw off it every year because they want to maintain a certain level so it will be healthy. And usually in recent years, it's been four, four and a half percent or something like that. Um, the, I do agree with Kathy's uh, statement of soft, soft wording. Um, I actually would prefer that at some point down the road, we think about looking at what the trend is uh, for things like um, marijuana and stuff like that to just get a sense of, you know, what should some of our markers be? Um, but I also wanna be very clear that it's not all of the reserves that are above 5% or the required number that we have, it's some percentage of those reserves. Um, so those are kind of my, my observations and I'm hoping I'm reading this correctly. Um, I do look at the uh, committee recommendation and I just wanna make sure we understand this is a short-term committee. It is a, um, as I think stated, an ad hoc committee it will go away. However, it may, a follow-on committee may be part of the plan because that follow-on committee uh, might be, you know, not unlike a CPA committee or something like that. And once a year, they, um, you know, recommend, uh, and actually CPA, you know, CPA is a good example. They recommend to the town council a certain number of projects they're going to fund. And then the town council vote on that um, so that it, it does have a sense of a feel of engagement um, of a uh, invested group of people. Uh, but I, I just want to confirm that this committee charge is not a long-term committee charge. It is a get the guidelines done, come back and propose them, and then a next uh, committee might be formed. And, and by the way, GOL passed this. And really the only way, only reason we're looking at the committee charge is as it relates to the finances. But that's, you know, but any other, any questions or answers to that, that question? Guess not. I don't think, so. well, of course, there's two other, um, several other people with their hands up. Um, Michelle is uh, somebody who's, uh, you know, outside of the committee, but here's uh, representing the original advocates for setting up a reparations fund. Do you have anything you want to say now, or shall I continue on recognizing other members of the committee? I, I do have a couple comments and questions, but I can wait until the end as well. That that whatever you feel is the best. Flow. Okay, I just didn't want to cut you off if you had something no, that you felt all. urgent to say now. Um, Bob Hegner, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, echo uh, Kathy's concerns that we be clear about uh, the, the process for deciding how much funds are made available each year and some soft language that allows that amount to vary depending on the, the finances of the town. And I also wanna echo Pat's recommendation that we make this, set this up so that um, individuals or, or um, nonprofits or whatever could contribute uh, to the fund in addition to any money that the town might, might put in there. <clears throat> That's all, thanks. Thank you, Bernie. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. Um, again, my concern is, is that we are creatures of the state, our charter notwithstanding. 
Um, so we have to be cautious of that. I like the idea of using a stabilization fund. The Department of Revenue has been very generous in allowing lots and lots of special purpose uh, stabilization funds. I don't think that there will be difficulties in, in having individuals, corporations or groups make contributions to the stabilization fund. It might be a little bit of a, dub, a double step um, with the council accepting the, uh, the, the donation and then a super majority vote to include it into the into the uh, into the fund. I would also offer the cautions about um, you know guidelines here in terms of, of how much is going in, how much can come out should be should be suggestions and not mandates because things will vary. And uh, we, we may not find we may not find that we don't have the opportunity to invest the funds the way the Forbes Library trustees do or the the Jones Library trustees do. We might not be able to bring Vanguard in as a funds manager, um, <clears throat> given that uh, Massachusetts is usually pretty restricted in, in where you can place public funds. So with, with those cautions, I think this is a, a really good framework and would like to continue with it. Yeah, well, thank you. Dorothy, do you have anything to add? Because then I was, uh, was using your hand up too now. Um, I, I believe the Jones Library um, fund is private, not town. So there is a difference. It's not just like the Jones Library fund. And, and Bernie, the Jones Library fund, I believe, is in Vanguard. It is not, quote unquote, actively managed. Uh, it's doing very better with Vanguard. Um, so um, I don't know what difference it makes that it's not, So I mean, it, but I just wanted to point out, it would be a town fund. I don't know. Have we had any other town funds like this in the past? That would be my question. Um, so not quite like this. Um, you know, we have our OPEB funds. Our OPEB funds are in a trust and they're invested a little bit differently because of um, the nature of being in a trust and in a, in a long, again, a long-term investment vehicle and they're um, with the state that has a little bit more, um, they're, they're invested by the state who uses investment professionals. Um, and so our regular funds, as, as Bernie mentioned, we do have restrictions on sort of what types of uh, investments we can put them into. Um, so yeah, we don't, this again, this is, this is an initial idea that we wanted to see if you like, again, the framework, the, the concept, and we would start researching some of these pieces more and, and trying to come back with a more um, you know, some more details of how this could be done. This is, um, you know, I, again, I, I take Kathy's comment earlier as, as a good one of, um, you know, 4%, maybe that's doable for the Jones library. Maybe that's not doable for us if we can't invest it the same way. So um, all those things we'd still have to dig into more um, going forward. Thank you. Michelle? Uh, yeah, thank you. This is... Um... This is really great. The memo was great. Thank you. Um, just a couple comments based on what I'm hearing and, and maybe a couple questions. Um, so I think this is a change to the charge um, because I think that the charge, as I think Kathy pointed out, um, talks about identifying possible revenue streams. So I'm not sure that that has to go away. It's the, the committee could still work to identify other possible revenue streams, but I think, um, you know, this, um, yeah, so just that piece. And then um, I also think just to note what Lynn said that this is um, a temporary or an ad hoc committee that is being tasked with certain things and will, um, will have an end to it. So my question is, um, how is there a body like the trustees of the Jones Library or something like that? Is there a body that would then be held together to make these recommendations on an annual basis? Um, and then the last question I have is, can the endowment um, be used, can the fund be used as collateral um, with say a local bank um, to make bank loans? Has, does anyone have any knowledge of, of that? Yeah, so starting with the last question first, we don't have any guidance yet on what types of um, 
what specific types of expenditures might be allowable. Um, so I don't, um, I, unless somebody else has heard something else, I, I don't think we know that yet. Um, in terms of a group or committee, I think that would be up to the council or the, or the manager in terms of creating something like that to um, provide that sort of advisory role. Um, I'm sorry, I think that what was the first part, the first question? Um, the first question was just clarifying if we need to clarify the charge prior okay. to being voted on. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the other one was all, an additional revenue stream. So I would say that what this does propose is, is a revenue stream that it's it's surplus from. So that's from uh, the the um, free cash that would be appropriate into. So I think that that would be seen as a revenue stream, but there could be additional revenue streams as well. First question might come up as to whether we're talking about just town-based revenue or um, as has been suggested with the donation question, uh, outside revenue, revenue streams that don't rely on town, specific town resources. Um, I think that's a subject that would be open still for some discussion under the way this committee charge is drafted. Um, the, another issue that had come up and sort of to get back to it in the end is that um, we uh, somehow there needs to be a process to make recommendations to the council about what are appropriate uh, expenditures from the fund and what expenditures are being proposed. and. Uh, I guess the question is whether the committee charge is sufficiently clear about trying to help establish such a process. Because uh, somehow we need one. I'm not sure exactly how Evanston does it if they have a committee that makes recommendations to their council, for example, um, and how the committee is structured. But I think that that is something that would need to be given some consideration. Uh, we do have the uh, charge. Um, I'm not sure that uh, we necessarily have to have the uh, finance committee position on the charge. Um, it's not strictly totally financial, but I'm open to it if that's proposed. So turning back again to members of the committee, uh, Kathy? Just on it was in reaction to some of the things oh that Michelle was saying you know the way if if there's an ongoing advisory committee if there is at least an ongoing set of guidelines that are developed on what the fund can be spent on um, one possibility to think about is that people propose each year which one of those possible uses you know and so that's what could happen over time. And that's the way CPA works. There's a very clear set of what the funds can be used for, but there's not a, the committee itself doesn't make a decision on what this year will be spent on. They wait. So you, you potentially could get people participating. So I'm not saying that's a way to do it, but that might be one way. So when um, the group that's thinking, the the, the group that's got the charge, might be thinking about um, possible different alternatives over time. Because the nice thing about that, you know, CPA has bigger chunks of money to spend, but that you can get small groups getting together and saying, you know, I think this would qualify. Let's come in with this idea this year. So you, you would not have it be as passive, potentially. So it's, it's just, it's a thought rather than a do it this way versus another way. Um, okay, we need to keep us moving because we do have a big agenda today, and uh, but I don't wanna cut this off. Uh, Bob? Yeah, I just wanted to suggest that um, one, another possible funding stream could be uh, matching contributions from you know, outside of the government, you know, you could set up a, a, a um, you know, a process by which, um, you know, a, a corporation individuals could provide matching funding or partial funding for a particular 
um, you know, investment that this fund would, would do, just as a thought. Um, so um, let's try and keep it brief, but not keep going. Dorothy? It's very brief. Um, also would like to have it as a possibility that you don't think of it as something that you have to spend every year. But if you choose not to take the disbursement that year, it builds the fund. Because um, you know this idea I keep talking about of a certain type of housing, which we have not been able to create if there were, but in the past, the Sunnyside Gardens was created from a fund. Originally, a fund came to help start. So um, I, I, you know, smarter mind, minds than mine will look at the different things, but I don't want to write a little set of rules that says you've got to do this, you've got to do that, because some options uh, might be not to spend it right away, but to build that fund. And I love the idea of Bob Hegner's of matching funds from corporations. That is really good. Thank you. Good. Yeah, I have, unless somebody objects, I'm ready to make a motion. Uh, can you hang on just a second and I'll come back to you in just a moment. I want to make sure I hear from Michelle and then I have one more thing I was just going to remind um, everybody about and then I think a motion would be in order and I'll come right back to you. Michelle? Just a super brief comment in response to what you said about Evanston. Um, yeah, they did set up a subcommittee that essentially determines possible uses and then presents them to the town council. And that seems to be working well. So, but we can certainly as the committee gets going, we'll be following that. So you would envision the committee uh, that's on the, currently on the screen for the draft charge is having this conversation. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. I th I think we'll be able to get our work done, um, you know, pretty quickly because <laughs> we've done a lot of work already. So, but I envision that this committee would um, would recommend to the town council those possibilities um, to create a process that could be sustainable for the town. So uh, I, the one thing I was going to add, and then I'm going to turn it back over to um, Lynn. To uh, she, since she seems to have a motion. And that is that uh, I think that it also has to be recognized that uh, any proposal that comes forward for expenditure, at the time that it comes forward, will need to be scrutinized as to whether it is consistent with um, the anti aid amendment to the, which is a provision in the Massachusetts Constitution. And it's a rather complex topic that I'm not sure that I want to try and get into any depth on or parse out. But it does have to do with um, how public funds can, uh, limitations on how public funds can be expended for private purposes. And uh, I, um, at some point, there may need to be a mechanism for any proposals to be reviewed uh, through the town attorney to uh, make sure that we're not uh, proposing an expenditure that is contradictory to the uh, anti-aid amendment. Um, but I think that that's a, a future issue, not a present issue, unless Paul or Sean have anything to add on that. I'm going to go ahead and go back to Lynn. Um, so I'm going to uh, ask Athena for the moment to put the memo up. Thanks. Uh, so I'm going to put this into two different motions because transfer every year will be different. Uh, so I recommend uh, that I I move that the ten, that the Finance Committee recommend to the Town Council the establishment of a refer, reparations stabilization fund for the purposes of um, uh, 
What do we want to say for the purposes of providing a stream of uh, providing a revenue stream for reparations? Just make it simple. Second, second. Angelus. Okay, there's a motion been made and seconded. Any further discussion on the motion that has been made? And uh, I assume that the uh, Bethina or Scott, who are uh, somebody has the motion down for the minutes. I do. Okay, does anybody want Athena to read that back? If not, then- uh, Yeah, could you just could you read it back one more? I mean, man, I just wanted to hear it one more time. I thought I heard something that might not fully- um, I think it would be a good idea to have it checked. Thank you. Not that it was wrong, wrong, just um, no, no, sure it's, technically it's- Sorry, I'll just, I'll put it, I'll share it so that we can all see it. Uh, to recommend the, to the town council the establishment of a reparations stabilization fund for the purposes of providing a revenue stream for reparations. Any questions? Lee, Sean, you, sound, you look like you have some amendments you want to make the way it's stated. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it, it just that the fund itself won't provide a revenue stream for reparations. It's more like it's, I mean, it, it may in the future. I guess, it, I mean, it, it could be fine. Um, yeah, I don't know if you can put restriction. I mean, you might want to just establish the fund. That, okay, so you want to just end it with the word fund? That's my initial inclination. Just um, what was in the what was in the one we sent? It said something about reparation purposes, right? Yeah, I was actually going to ask a question. That's a good segue for me to do that, and that is, um, you've provided. Um, I recommended approval order FY2215 in order creating a special purpose stabilization fund for reparations. Now, then this is what the motion should be. I'm going to withdraw my motion. Pat, do you agree to that? Yes. Uh, and my motion is to recommend to the town council approval of um, financial order uh, FY22-15, an order creating a special purpose stabilization fund for reparations. Second, D'Angelo. Okay, so now we're back to a motion on the floor with a slightly different motion. Uh, Sean, Paul, are you, do you feel comfortable going forward with this, uh, sending this order onto the council at this point? Yes. So uh, looking just to see if any hands go up and if not, I'm gonna be starting to call for a vote and um, we're following the us usual procedure that everybody in the committee will be asked to speak that members of the council, members of the committee um, will be voting yes or no and members who are resident members of the committee, whether they support the motion or not. Uh, so with that said, and having seen no hands go up, I'm just gonna go in the order from my uh, list as, a, as you appear on my participant list. So Lynn Griesmer. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Bob Hegner. I support it. Bernie Kubiak. Support it. Uh, Jane Shuffler. Oops. I support it. Kathy Shane. Yes. I vote yes. I think I have heard from everybody now. If I've Missed anybody, please speak up. But I think that we have a unanimous vote with all three members indicating their support who are resident members. So, uh, so my next question would be, are, Sean, are we waiting, or Paul, 
are we waiting until we do stabilization funds to actually transfer the money? The plan was um, to wait until we, so we typically would do a free cash transfer in the fall um, yep. after a free cash is certified. Um, and that is when the, at that time when the free cash is certified and it's brought back to the council to transfer whatever's above 5% to our regular reserve, this would be part of that action as well. So it'd be all, okay. it'd be one piece done together and then that could be replicated in future years. So there's no second, uh, motion at this time on no, the, issue. yeah no the and first piece was just to get the fund established andy i don't believe unless you unless there's changes we want that we need to make a motion regarding the committee charge um i will uh come back to the committee charge in just a second on the um on the chart uh, on the uh order that we just passed there was one question i was going to ask sean or paul and that is it said the two thirds vote would be required to pass this. And uh, this, I was wondering because uh, it takes a majority vote to put money into a stabilization fund, two thirds to take money from a stabilization fund. Does it take two thirds to create? Sean, the question is, does it take two thirds? Oops. The question is, Sean, does it take two thirds to create a stabilization fund or a majority vote? You're muted, though. Uh, two thirds is our understanding. Um, Sonia and I worked on this together. So, um, and so we can the, double check that. And the partner. attorney, I believe the attorney provided the language, but we can double check. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious because it takes the majority vote to put money into a fund two-thirds to take money out of a fund but uh i didn't know if there was what the requirement was on it so but let's leave it as is and if you need a, an amendment down the line we can handle it at that point but i think we can go on so um getting back then to the last point is the committee charge is there anybody on the finance committee uh, either and that's all members of course i'm speaking to you who wants to propose that um, th this committee take a position on that committee charge that was on the screen previously? Because if not, then um, I think we could go on to um, other agenda items. I would like us to move forward with the charge. We need to take a position as a finance committee. Right. Is that a finance issue? That's the question. Oh, okay. GOL is already, GOL has already passed, you know, recommended the charge and made all these changes. I'm not clear. And that, therefore, it can come to the council. But we were asked in the motion to look at it. But I don't know, unless Athena thinks we need to vote on it, I don't know that we do. Can you just go to the next, scroll to the next page? Um, it's number one. So this is, I don't want to change this now, but my question was that first clause, develop and recommend to the town council municipal rep, whoops, reparations plan that includes a reparation fund. So, it, it was reading to me like they were supposed to tell us how to do the fund was the only question I had on it where we're setting one up. I had no problem with the, anything else in this. So it was, it was purely a question. Um, this is clear as written and it's clear and actionable, but it looked like they would develop and recommend a reparation fund and a community-wide process. Um, so that was my question and, you know, since we weren't asked to edit this, maybe it's just a question I ask at the council then. Um, and then we can look to see if you want to, you know, propose amended amendments to it at the council. Right. Okay. So if that clause wasn't there, that includes a community-wide process and, you know, a strategy for, you know, Pat's idea that they could also raise money from other sources or something, but it was just this if it's reparation fund that might include other. So you have my 
that is my question. That's it. Right. No, no if, problem. If we make changes, technically it should have to go back to GOL. I just assume we make the changes when it comes to the council. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So that's just the one thing I was flagging when I read it. Andy, if I may, the the referral from the from the council was to refer the charge to the finance committee for recommendation on a possible revenue stream. The council didn't ask specifically for a recommendation on the charge, so I don't think we need a vote on it. Okay, thank you. That sort of was, was my thought on it too, but I wanted to make sure and thank you for sharing saying that. Uh, so I think that we can go on since nobody has uh, proposed differently. And I said that we would check. There are two people who are attendees at the moment. If either of the people who are attendees would like to offer public comment on any issues before the committee, uh, they certainly are welcome to do so. And I uh, so I'll look for a raised hand for just one moment. And if I don't see a raised hand, then I'm going to ask Sean and Paul whether they have a recommendation for um, the next, any issues that they would like us to take up next on the agenda. And seeing no hands go up from attendees. Uh, Paul? So I think we have two staff here, um, Holly Bowser, who's ready to go over the third quarter budget report and then the optional tax exemption for, with um, Liz Duffy. So they're both available and so helping them through the afternoon would be appreciated. Okay. And Michelle, thank you very much. Appreciate it. You can, uh, she was waving goodbye to us. Uh, I'm going to turn I to the... Uh, quickly, I am going to have to leave the meeting. I apologize. If I can come back in, I will. I need to lie down. Well, I understand. And... Uh, feel better. Feel better. You probably need to shut your eyes and not be staring at the screen. Uh, you could also, if you would like, you're welcome to just, yeah, not, I'm gonna just uh, stop your video and listen. That's yeah. what I'm going to try. Okay, then we will consider you present because you're in the meeting. You're just not. I will your... let you know if I leave, leave. <laughs> it's kind of like I did the other night. Thank you. Uh, I feel better. So. Let's turn to the third quarter report. And um, do you want to have that up on the screen for um, questions? Is that the helpful way to go about it? And uh, yeah, so Holly, do, do you want to say anything about this or just um, answer questions? Um, I'll do my short little spiel. Um, so just to remind folks that the um, report is available on the website under the accounting department's main page. Uh, you know, your third quarter report is um, three quarters of the way through the fiscal year, which equates to approximately 75%. And, um, you know, many of the variances that you see are timing issues. We are in pretty good shape through March 31st. Um, because of our much reduced FY21 budget figures. Um, the report um, sort of speaks for itself, but I'm just gonna go over a couple of things. So revenues were at 80% of our budget on March 31st. Uh, the first several items that you see listed under the revenue, uh, things like the Cherry Hill Golf Course recreation and fees, um, as well as a few other items like the hotel motel and cannabis tax were not budgeted in FY21 at all. Uh, so we do have, and we have collected revenues uh, in those places. Then things like fines and forfeits and investment income, licenses, permits, rentals were much reduced um, because of the uncertainty of the pandemic. And those have done better than what our budget projections were. Um, this report really does a good job of explaining um, the, the differences in the percentages to what you would expect the 75% to be. And a lot of them are timing issues. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, and then on the expense side, we are currently at 72% of our budgeted expenses, which is a little bit lower than anticipated at this time of year. And that is the result of, you know, some reduced operations, transitions, vacancies in staff. Um, many of our others, um, I'm sorry, uh, some of the other um, percentages of that are over the 75% are simply due to timing issues. And again, they are explained. Um, snow and ice is hopefully over for the year. No, it definitely is. And we do not have a deficit in snow and ice this year, which we'll need to raise. So that's good news. Uh, the enterprise funds are being really closely monitored by the finance department and DPW. Uh, water and sewer revenues are down, uh, but we're hoping that reductions in expenditures are, will offset any revenue deficits. And I just want to say that, you know, this is a year like no other year has been in terms of budgeting. And I think that the budget management has been, has been better than we anticipated. It's, it, things are going well. And I'll just add a, a couple of things, if I could, just to reiterate what Holly said, which is um, revenue, general fund revenues are generally doing better than expected, but expected was roughly a 30% reduction in some areas. So um, they're not doing necessarily well compared to prior years. Um, and so the, one of the, the reports you'll see at the end, it gives you that trend of prior years through three quarters compared to this year through three quarters. Um, compared to our budget for this year. That's a nice addition that Sonia put together this year um, to really give you a sense of where we're at. Um, and then the big thing is, well, the general fund, the general fund is generally doing pretty well. Um, three out of four of our enterprise funds are not, and that can impact the general fund. Um, that's something we're gonna have to make some decisions about if there's a deficit in the enterprise funds, how we, uh, an annual deficit, not an overall deficit, but, but if, um, if we, we see a, a if we have to decide whether we're going to take a big bite out of reserves in the enterprise funds or if, or if we're going to you know see if we can shift some expenses around um, between the general fund and the enterprise funds. So um, the enterprise funds again are, are going to struggle water, sewer, and transportation um, quite a bit this year. So, and so we're yeah we're happy to answer any yeah. questions. Yeah, and I'm going to recognize people for questions. Um, and I'll save mine for later. Kathy. I'm just unmuting. Um, thank you for this report. Um, I see this, um, need, both of you kept a nice level voice, but I see this as pretty good news. Um, is the way I read the third quarter report. And with expenditures running at 72% and revenues running at 80, my question, I have two questions. One is, do you ever, off of by third quarter, do your guesstimate, it's gonna be a back of the envelope on what you think the year end is gonna be like. So I know there's some things we front pay um, and as you said, it, you know, so sometimes we're at a hundred percent because we paid them all at the beginning, but by third quarter, are you now at more of a two is one question. And then if I go to specific line items that are well below 75%, so elementary, elementary school was one and, um, police, they were both at 62, 63%. So I, Holly, you said some of this is there were vacancies, there was turnover, there was uh, some running lower. So I have two questions on those two. And I, I just picked up big ticket items rather than the small ones. Um, so on police, the budget did line said 50, Paul, but you held two positions. Is this running well below in part because we didn't fill two positions, you know, so that we were running at 48 minus a couple, you know, so that we weren't staffed up. So I never knew whether the budget was still as if all 50 would be hired during the year. So that was the question on police. And then on the elementary school, it's, uh, do you have a sense of what that is attributed to? And if they run well under what does that just turn into free cash that goes into the general fund or is that at all available for schools? Those are my two questions. Holly, do you want me to do the school one? I think I have a, a hint at what the major cause is there. Go right ahead. Um, I think I do too, but I'll let you. We'll see if, we'll see if we're on the same track. Um, so 
uh, schools, many of the staff are paid over the summer, um, July and August. And there's a journal entry um, that's done in, the, uh, in June to put those two months of expenses into the month of June, attribute them to this fiscal year. We always pull them back. It's, it's an accrual that we have to do every year. Um, so at the time that this is looking at actual expenses, that accrual wouldn't be there. So I'm not saying that they're not um, performing better than budgeted, but I don't think they're performing that much better than budgeted. My guess is it's because this doesn't reflect that um, that journal entry that's going to hit at the end of June. In this case, it's one that there's some rear loading of expenses. Yeah, yeah. For, for a lot of te a lot of teachers choose to extend their summer their pay over the summer. Um, Paraprofessional, paraprofessional. Any school year employees have the option essentially to um, extend their pay out over July and August so that they don't go two months without pay. Um, so that's a and that's a you know that's over a million dollars sometimes um, in terms of that journal entry that gets brought back. Is it still referred to as summer money? Yeah. Um, I don't call it that, but so I'm sure that this sounds like it could be called that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then what was the other category? So I had police and, you know, the police is the line item. It was, it was always set at 50, but then we held two positions. Mm -hmm. And so they never went to 50 during the year. And I, and it, my sense is it was even lower. So is that a, is that a expect the police budget's going to be coming in well under what it was budgeted for was my question is it in part because that was as if it was funded but you know and paul would know more on you did you right. already adjust it that they weren't you weren't going to have at most you were going to have them for half a year because we were holding them until january so no well i can weigh in a little bit just talking to sonia that there's a number of vacant positions in the police department and they weren't filled this year um so that's the the primary cause i believe Okay. There was, I think we said at this point, there was four or five um, vacant positions that have been vacant for a while. And so my opening question is, if you know revenues are at 80% and on the third quarter, expenses are at 72%, can you do guesstimates on what we're going to do year end or is that too risky? Um, I believe Sonia does try to project out, at least on the expenditure side, um, what we're going to uh, payrolls through the rest of the year to make sure we're on track. Um, I don't have the specific figures. And again, the thing I worry about this year in particular is how the enterprise funds do and what impact, what residual impact there might be. Um, I don't, you know, I, the general fund is going to do fine as my understanding. Um, it's really the enterprise funds and how the, the final few months end up um, parking, to, at, parking as well. And just to add to that, so the um, Holly and, and Sonia are right now talking with department heads to get all projected expenditures through the end of the fiscal year and vacancies in, in enrollment um, payroll projections. So um, so they have a handle on what's going to happen. I'm sure they're doing some back of the envelope stuff, but I don't think there's anything to share at this point. Yeah, and, and I, I did mean back of the um, I would never, even if you had a number, I wouldn't ask you what it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it is, it's, it's still, you've got still three months, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Sean and uh, Paul and Sean, I, I'm assuming that we are still looking at the ARPA funds to possibly make up the deficit in the enterprise funds. So it's not quite that simple anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I was hoping um, they clarified guidance that said we cannot use ARPA money um, for utilities um, to, to really kind of cover those lost revenues in utilities. Um, when I looked at the latest definition of utilities, it included water, but it did not include sewer, but it's something I need to dig into more. So it's possible that maybe for transportation and for sewer, we can use ARPA money to cover that deficit. Um, but it, I don't at this point, unless they, there are, there are people who are working on changing that definition because a lot of um, other towns and cities across the country um, did not like that part of the ARPA guidance that you couldn't use it for utilities. Um, unless that's changed, I don't believe we're gonna be able to use ARPA for water um, to cover any water deficit. Maybe not sewer as well. I think that's the part I need to find out more about. Anything else, Lynn? Um, I'm, I'm wondering, is the um, 
example, the town gets, I think, $40 for every uh, COVID vaccine that it gives. And I'm just wondering where that appears in here. That's a great question. Um, it doesn't appear in here. Um, so what we have done is set up a um, special revenue fund to collect those payments. We haven't actually gotten any yet. We've been working with um, yeah. the health department and uh, I believe it's UMass Medical of the state to you know figure out when these things are going to start coming in. But you've, you know we've given out a lot of vaccines and we're getting reimbursed for those vaccines. So um, we have set up a special fund to collect that money. Um, we do have expenses already that have been charged to that fund for those who are managing the vaccine clinics. Um, and, and then there will probably be some difference at the end that we'll have to decide on what happens at that point. Do you have any idea what it might be? I mean, you're, you're right. It's great that you can charge the expenses to that. So right. you, you don't go under on that, but. Yeah, I don't want to speculate too much until I actually see money coming in. I mean, we were optimistic that it would be a significant, you know, in the several hundreds of thousands of dollars um, range, because of, you know, 40, $40 a shot, I, I, and it may even be higher than 40. I thought I heard it might be 80, um, but multiplied by the number of vaccines that we've given. So, you know, we're expecting a pretty large number on that. Um, the question is, what can it be used for once our vaccine expenses are gone? Because um, usually when something's in a special revenue fund, it's limited to certain purposes um, that you can spend it on. So those things, I think this is a unique accounting thing because I don't believe there, we've had a vaccine revolving fund before. Holly, have we? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, so, so we've been in con uh, contact with like the Department of Revenue and, and the uh, Division of Local Services um, to figure out what happens to this money at year end, if there's anything left over, can it carry forward? And um, they said it can carry forward. I just don't know what happens once we don't have any more vaccine expenses to charge to it. Thank okay. you. But good question. So my questions are about the next page on the memo under miscellaneous non-recurring and then title it a little bit further down. Um, but when you, um, on the miscellaneous non-recurring, what it's really getting into is the revenue that we're receiving uh, from colleges and the university in some fashion or another. Um, what was going on with Amherst College that we're getting more than budgeted? Is there an additional amount that they're negotiating and was it for a purpose or was it general? I believe that, uh, again, I have to double check with Sonia. I believe that is related to ambulance billing, um, that there's a, a fee they pay us related to that and it goes into that section. It, it's weird because you think it would go into the ambulance fund, but I believe it goes there. Um, but Holly, do you know if that's the case? That is correct, yes. Okay. And, um, and they always kind of round it up. They're very generous in that way. So I, um, it has to, it definitely um, is in relation to the ambulance billing and, uh, and then it's, a, it's rounded up each year. Yeah, we have a, a formula for both UMass and Framers College that is sort of retroactive and looks back a year um, for billing. You know, those payments additional to any insurance we might obtain from? I believe so. But that, that's an, an answer I can get the, a confirmation on. Okay. Uh, under the other departmental that I saw as I was going through, or excuse me, miscellaneous non recurring, uh, was reference to the hotel motel tax. And for the benefit of the committee as a whole, I can give you a little bit of the uh, background of that. The uh, UMass Hotel that is part of Campus Center, uh, there's, it was some question for a long period of time about whether or not when we started being able to collect a municipal uh, part of uh, hotel motel tax, whether that was taxable property within the town of Amherst and should have been paid. And the university did not want to do that, but it was not really the money question as much as it was the um, as other principles. So then the agreement was made that they were going to make payments to us 
on an annual basis for the amount of the hotel motel tax that was not attributable to rooms paid for by the university itself that would then, uh, uh, but was collected from outside visitors and that that money would be conveyed to the town on an annual basis. Uh, when I looked at the um, other lines for hotel motel meals tax, um, as is, uh, I think you just a couple paragraphs below, uh, there was hotel motel tax that was being collected for other properties. It was less than prior years, but it wasn't zero. Uh, is anybody um, asking that question at UMass as to whether they totally closed the hotel or whether it was still open and well and um, yeah we we reached out to them and and at least i could double check um but when we reached out to them the, we were told it was closed and they didn't think it would be reopening um at least for a while when we reached out but that was a couple months ago so we can double check on what the status of um when it's going to be re reopening more to the public they, um they had dedicated the campus center hotel to for their isolation quarantine shelter. And that's anybody who had to be isolated or quarantined were housed in the in the campus center hotel. So they weren't renting out rooms. Okay, um, I just wanted to follow up on that. My last comment is that uh, further down in the thing, in, in, in the report at the very, um, on the same page, you see the pilot section and it talks about the fact that we have enterprise funds there. I, I know from talking to several members of the council who are not members of the finance committee that they are aware of the question as to whether we are receiving um, payments in lieu of taxation from nonprofits and particularly from the uh, university and colleges. And this has been a conversation that has been had been in various places for a while. So I was just, uh, commenting on the fact that I think that when it gets to the council and we convey this along, uh, there's going to be some degree of confusion and misunderstanding about why we're calling uh, payments in lieu of taxation uh, miscellaneous non-recurring and what they think of as pilot is not pilot. So it's just a comment more than anything else. So, uh, then were you asking, so, raising your hand? Or, okay, so I think that was it. Is there anything else regarding the quarterly report? Then, uh, I don't know that we have the staff present to talk about the, uh, um, tax issues that um yeah liz is here she's um, just as under uh she, i'm she under holly's name yeah oh faces keep changing it's cute what okay. can i help you with um we are collecting um pilot monies from our our uh properties that are under pilot as usual um, they do pay a, a certain amount that's agreed to um, every year, so it's not not recurring. It's recurring every year. Um, as far as the hotels, motels, we do charge them uh, two hundred dollars per bed, so uh, they are still paying those those fees. Anthony or Andy, do you want me to do a little? Um, do you want us to transition to the optional tax exemption or? Yeah, I think we can. Uh, thank you for, for saying that. I think uh, the, uh, obviously it's more of a suggestion for um, consideration for future reports. Certainly. Um, the report that is, is written is, is written and greatly appreciated you know, and a lot of work goes into it, but just for the future uh, so that we don't get this confusion from other members of the council who haven't been Privy to this conversation. Which part of the report are you looking at? I, I'm not sure that I contributed to that particular part. Yeah, I, well, I think we're transitioning, right, to a different yeah, topic. Yeah, I'll, I'll work with um, Liz. I'll work with Sonia Understood. on that one because that's really how Sonia uh, categorize how we well really it's how we have historically categorized things, and if we can somehow um, 
just make it more clear what's in there. Yeah, whatever um, I can do to help. Yeah, because as you, as you pointed out, it is re hopefully recurring, not non-recurring. Uh, anyway, we we uh, at this point want to uh, change topics of conversation and uh, move over to the question of uh, the optional tax exemptions. And uh, um, I guess it depends on what you're talking about as optional tax exemptions. Um, I mean, one of the things that I was asked to point out is there is a CPA exemption. Um, if someone is income limited, uh, they can apply for an exemption from the CPA. That's the community preservation uh, fee. So Liz, this is, um, this is a specific yeah. one, but um, Athena, can you pull up the memo for this one on the um, screen? So this is specifically the um, the um, personal exemptions. Actually, can you go to the um, the memo? I think it's it breaks it down a little more clearly. Okay, we have all the personal exemptions for you as well. Um, yeah, right there. There we go. So again, this is about there's a you know there's a base exemption for the the categories that you see in the chart below and the town of Amherst. Uh, this is sort of a housekeeping thing. Has historically always opted to increase that the amount of that exemption. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can see the base amount, the optional amount, and then the total. And those are FY21 figures, so you can get a sense of the, the magnitude. Um, I am not seeing it on my screen. Am I missing something? You're not seeing it on the, um, the Zoom screen? Ah, I see it now. I'm sorry. Thank you. So um, when, when they're looking at those particular clauses, um, the veteran surviving spouse, veteran's disability, legal blind, senior clause uh, 41C, um, those are um, usually qualifications that involve income related uh, qualifications and we have a website uh, link that goes to the assessor's office if you look under the assessor's office under exemptions and personal exemptions you'll see a list of all of these. Um, for anybody that's interested in them, of course, if anybody has difficulty they can always reach out to the tet the assessor's office and we'll be glad to guide them through it. Is there any questions about this. Um, so, the, so this is an action that the town council has to vote every year, right, yeah. Sean? Yeah. So that's yeah. why this is before you today. And they have to vote it before July first, is my understanding too, to make sure it's in effect for the the next year of um, taxes. I mean, this is was done by town meeting every year for anybody who's for those of you who were on town meeting. It's and we did it last year's council. Uh, this is not new. It's just simply recognizing that there are these categories that are listed and uh, that there's a base amount under state statute and there's a local option to go to a higher amount and it has been traditional in Amherst to uh, grant the local uh, exemption. Uh, and as, uh, I, if I'm not misstating it, Anybody who's in any of these categories, like uh, veterans, surviving spouses, uh, uh, surviving parents, legally blind, they, all of those categories, uh, there's also an income eligibility contribution. So it's not every veteran, it's every veteran who qualifies under an income qualification piece. and. Uh, it's, uh, you know, there's the base exemption and uh, we locally have opted each year, but it has to be acted on each year. Dorothy? Um, could uh, she walk us through an example? Uh, for example, the, the, the senior. Uh, Certainly. What um, for, for a senior exemption, um, we take applications in July. Um, that we look at assets and we look at income and that asset and income uh, information changes every year. Um, the applications themselves, you can actually look at them right online. Um, although right now I'm getting an oops from Massachusetts uh, from the state. So we'll have to fix that link. Um, yeah, it's, it's giving me an oops. I'm so sorry. Um, Cause I was going to say it's a really good 
good setup because we send you right to the state to get your application. But I'll make sure that's working by the time we have to get those applications going or actually I'm going to get on the phone right after we get done talking. But um, basically what you want to do is reach out to the assessor's office. You're going to have to have your uh, federal income tax. You're going to have to have any rental income and uh, your social security income. Um, you'll also have to divulge any assets, uh, including second homes, etc. So you have to actually meet two criteria. One is income and one is uh, assets. So and the, what, what, what you're seeing in this, this spreadsheet here is um, you're looking at how many accounts in each one of these categories. And for the, uh, for the seniors, we have 29. And we, uh, we have a base of 29,000 that's coming from the state and the town is kicking in another 12,998 for a total of $41,998 going out to help seniors that are income limited. Yeah, I thought this was a, this isn't money they're gonna get. This is money they don't have to pay, I thought, a tax exempt, a personal exemption. Yes, it comes off their taxes. It comes off their taxes. So <laughs> uh, this, these numbers then are what the town received is what you're telling me, not the rules that a senior would use to figure out. No, no, no. This has nothing to do with their income levels, no. no. So, this is the just a levels. summary. Of, so this is a summary of how many were issued in FY21 um, yeah. and, like, and the total amounts of those. Um, so in aggregate, this is sort of the, the sum of all these personal exemptions in FY21. So when you said the state, the state does not give you money to make up for what you didn't collect, does it? The state does give us back some funds. That's the yeah. twenty nine thousand portion. Yeah, this, there's the a partial town is footing the twenty eight, the twelve thousand nine ninety eight of that forty one thousand nine ninety eight. Okay, thank you very much. You're so welcome. So, Kathy. Um. Just, I did click, Liz, on the PDF for seniors. So one of my recommendations, and I don't know how much work it would be, not a lot of people know what the um, exemption is, you know, on right. what, to, what, what do I qualify? They have to find you, find a form, and it might be useful if we had just a very simple sheet. So I looked up on seniors that your income, if you're a couple, has to be up under 44,000 and you can't have any more than 66,000 in assets. Correct. You know, yes. so just if there's a simple little crib sheet because some people might be eligible and not know about it. Exactly, and exactly. I, and I have the same thing about, I know CPA, a lot of people are not aware that they could um, be income eligible, but I, I'm thinking when, even when we vote on it, I, I'm not sure counselors know what the actual exemption is you know so this is saying do we want to go to the max um which i'm totally supportive of but i just think it would be useful and since that doesn't change very much if we put something simple together once um then it could accompany this annual um decision to go to the option the options we've actually worked on this together with my staff and there's going to be something uh, up on that website so that we can show you what the the income limits are um, when that becomes public so that it, re it gets revises it gets revised every year um, it usually has to do with the cost of living increase and the social security increase annually um, the state tells us what those increases are and then we publish them accordingly okay. and 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 then just, you know what i'm thinking is sean i'm sorry to cut you okay. off go ahead no, no, just on that same topic. And, and Liz is also working on a flyer um, mm -hmm. that we plan on sending out in the, the, not the next tax bill, but the one after that. The December tax bill, the actual. Yeah, it's sort of a one pager um, that lays out the different exemptions that are available to people. It was in response to, you know, what we heard at the CPA um, committee. So it'll have, you know, this stuff on there. It'll have the CPA stuff on there, but um, we are working on, you know, sort of a, another mechanism for communicating these options to people. Is there any chance, and I'm just, I'm partly thinking we do have an audience for when we are voting on this um, at the council meeting. Is there something simple that all the counselors would have in the packet? Or would that take too much work to get this done by then? And Absolutely not. I'd be glad to send it to you all in advance and actually give you a presentation at the meeting. Yeah, because I would use it, for example, in a district meeting, I would use it like once. Sure. 
people might not be aware, you know, so we're voting on something that's good for people in town, even though it's a limb, you can see the numbers. It's not like we're reaching thousands of people with it, <laughs> but it and is. I, I do hope to get to the Bang Center to our senior center so that I can present myself so that folks know that I am approachable and they can ask me questions about these programs. Thank you. That was my only comment. Excellent. So can uh, we put approval order 2211 on the screen? Uh, somebody has it. Thank you. So I think that what um, we would need if we want to recommend that the council do this and remember that it, um, if the council doesn't do this by June 30th, then it doesn't happen for next year. Um, but what would be in order is a motion to recommend approval order 2211 to the council if somebody feels I'm ready. Um, I recommend that the, I move that the finance committee recommend to the town council approval of order FY22-11 and order approving the acceptance of optional tax exemptions for FY22. Second, DeAngelis. Yeah, I'm glad you're still here with us. <laughs> yep. Uh, Can't get rid of me. So let's just say you're not looking at the rest of us as you're uh, listening. To us. Good. Uh, anyway, uh, we have a motion that's been made and seconded. Um, is there any further discussion on the motion? If not, we'll come to a vote. Seeing no requests for uh, discussion, then. Uh, We'll uh, start, I guess, with uh, Pat. So then. Aye. And Kathy? Yes. Dorothy? Yes. Um, Bob Hegner? Support. <clears throat> uh, Bernie Kubiak? Supported. Uh, Jane Scheffler? Jane? I'm, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I support. Lynn? Yay. And I support it. Uh, I vote yes. So it passes unanimously with uh, support from all three resident members of the committee. So thank you very much for the uh, presentation and uh, answering the questions and responding. So. Uh, I think we can go back to the next item on the agenda that we would want to take up. Um, would, is there staff, the staff have recommendations to what to get to next? Um, so I think the two remaining topics are, or well, the two that we wanted to definitely get to are um, the budget actions uh, reviewing the budget motions um, for FY22. And then I think following up on, if, if there is any follow up on the capital improvement program uh, public forum. Okay, and as far as the capital improvement public, um, we've we've actually voted on the orders already. Right, yeah, it's really just a discussion. So it's just a any... question of whether there's any discussion that flows in the, I think that there's only one person who even offered a comment that the, uh, Forum. Sean? Well, yeah, and, and you know, I talked to Paul a little bit about this. The the one um, comment that was made at the Capital Improvement Program Public Forum um, was about the town potentially having the ability to um, fund the school project without going out for debt exclusion. Um, and I think the the one thing I'll just say is the plan that we had worked on and presented to Finance Committee. Um, you know, one of the goals that we had built into that plan was making sure that we had funding for other capital needs in town and that we weren't sort of diverting all funding for capital towards the four building projects. Um, that was communicated through many different sessions that it was important that we don't lose track of other capital um, or, other, or other assets in town and that we continue to maintain them. Um, and so again, when you, the, the plan that we put forward maintains funding for other assets in addition to trying to fund some, three of the four building projects. Okay. Yeah, I have a question, Sean. I sent it to you separately, but I wanted to ask it publicly. I'd asked it once before. 
Um, and it's, uh, if you don't have an answer yet, that's fine. When you go out for a debt exclusion, um, if we said the number for schools is 40, could we, if we had 20 internal, I know we don't have 40, if we had 20, which we don't, but if we had 20, could you go out for 20 of it and then fund the rest internally? So it, Bernie is nodding his head that yes, you could do it. So I think I wanna confirm, my understanding is you either exclude the debt or you don't, um, but I, and that you don't, doesn't mean you necessarily have to use all of the debt exclusion. Um, but that's, and maybe I'm wrong on that since Bernie and, and Lynn are both not in their head. Maybe they've been through this before. Um, but that's something I wanted to confirm before I answered you was, um, I thought what I was reading was that you either exclude the debt for a project or you don't, um, and that there wasn't a specific um, percentage of that debt that you're excluding, but that's something that we can get an answer to pretty quickly. And, and the re I'm asking in part because uh, the school building committee, we just got approved to move to the next step of feasibility. And if we can stay on a tight timeline, we would be bringing it to a townwide vote in November of 2022. And to the optics of bringing the school to a townwide vote for a, a potential debt exclusion, I, I keep wanting to say override, I'll use the full, the full wording of it for 40 million, up to 40 million while funding the same year, we'd be probably appropriating the money through debt for um, DPW would be up then the way you've got a schedule. I think it's unfortunate optics. So I just wanted to know, do we have any, can we make a decision again about the building uh, timing? You know, is this, you know, since we're only talking about FY22 right now, um, um, you know, the, so we're talking about FY23 is when we'd be taking it out for a, a public referendum. So it's, it's purely a piece of information right now that I wanted to ask and so we could get an answer. I know we can't do 40 internally. Right. Okay. That I, that your, your model, no matter what I did with it, I couldn't, I couldn't get 40 out of it and leave anything left to repair a building or build a road. Um, so, but, but that's the question. Okay, no, I will try to get an answer um, either tomorrow or, or Monday. And, I'll send, and what I'll do is I'll send it to the full committee just so everyone has it um, on this meeting. I thought I, I wanted to get an answer so we could have a record of trying to get the answer and at least knowing knowing the answer. That. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So um, anything more to be said about the capital? Then um, I guess that where we're at is uh, to get back to the review of other budget recommendations and uh, whether there's any discussion or proposals that need to come for that, that people want to come forward about actions previously taken that we've discussed. And uh, obviously that could include the community responder program. Lynn. I'd like permission to share my screen. Sure. Whoops. I'm sure I know what's being shared. Um, all right, I have a problem. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to uh, state uh, something first of all about the motion that I made last week. It's this motion right here on top. And I've highlighted a couple of areas. One is the area of seeking funds. The second is the issue of eight community responders. And third is the other elements of the program. Uh, I wanna make sure people understand that when I say seeking funds, I mean seeking multiple year grant funds. I 
I feel like the last resort is our budget. And the, this, is a, this motion was made as a motion outside the budget motion. Um, when I said eight positions, it was in addition to the four that the town manager has proposed. And I then referred to proposed, and I added all of this because it was not made clear to me or maybe, and I think some other counselors, that when the town manager presented to us his plan um, at, on the 27th of June of May, it, will actually, it actually was now the budget. So this was an unnecessary piece. In addition to that, so now I would like to make a motion for reconsideration. And I come back to the chair because I would like to amend the original motion. So um, having thought about this and being prepared for it, uh, I did consult with my process expert, uh, who is also on the Charter Commission, Mandy Haneke. And Mandy uh, said that if this were to, something like this were to come up at the meeting, that we should follow section 7.5 of the Council Rules of Procedure, which provide that at the meeting where the vote is taken or the next regular meeting, which in this case is this meeting that we're at, this is the next regular meeting, that any councilor voting with the prevailing side of any measure may move for reconsideration. Um, so, um, I can consider a motion from Lynn to reconsider based upon the fact that she was on the prevailing side. So I move to reconsider. Second, yeah. DeAngelis. Seems I think, to be I think Lynn, I think, I think for clarity, you would move to reconsider that specific motion. I move to reconsider the motion to recommend the town council that they direct the town manager to seek funds to fill eight community responder positions and the other elements of the program as proposed on May 27th, 2020 and report back to the town council and residents of Amherst how he plans to accomplish this no later than January 31st, 2022. And there's, and there's has been a second because I think I heard Pat seconding. Yes. Um, so uh, the first vote would be on the question of reconsideration benefits on um, if the committee is willing to reconsider, then I would be able to uh, take a motion uh, as far as uh, any amendment to the motion that would come forward. Um, and I will go back, I think, to Lynn first, as you probably have more to say. Uh, but let me first uh, recognize Dorothy because she has her hand up. Um, I, I have not been part of this discussion, and so it's uh, I'm having difficulty understanding uh, what has been said. So uh, what you said, but what is not written here is you're seeing eight community responder positions in addition to the four, not in addition, you're saying eight total. Okay. So that's what it says here. So why is there a confusion? Why do you have to re-say that? Doesn't that say that? I mean, we, I remember voting on eight. Okay. I remember the discussion on there's nothing changed about the eight, and okay. I don't want to change the eight. The eight is a total of the four original and four additional. Okay. So when I spoke about this then, uh, my hope is that the 90,000 from Senator Comerford has placed in the Senate budget comes through conference committee and final approval of budget, and that we can find additional multi-year grant funds for the other two positions. Well, but my question still is, what is the problem with what we voted? Um, There's nothing. I do have a, some slight modifications to the motion that I've lined down here. 
and I would just bring those up, but we have to agree to reconsider first. Okay, all right. I think you. Yep. You I, I got just put in, you got put in and inserted so people can't see your amended motion. I haven't made it. Yet. We just need to reconsider that last whether we need to agree whether or not we will reconsider. So can so I just good. yeah, Kathy? So I just we are voting to reconsider and then we will vote on the wording of this motion, right? Because I have a couple changes to recommend, including when you meant. 2022, not 2021. He's not going to report back to us last year, so it has a typo in it. Mm -hmm. But but beyond that, so we'll do that next, correct? That's correct. Yes, that would be the process because. Uh, Fine, that's all I wanted because uh, I, I I have another. We follow, we're following Rule 7.5, and right. uh, so we would first have to vote on the motion to reconsider anything. Further, Lynn, that you want to say? I know Lynn and Kathy, both of your hands up, but that might have been from before. I'm taking mine down. That I just wanted to clarify that we will get to discuss the actual memo after we vote to. I'm fine with reconsidering. I think this needs to be reworked. So I like I like it. So we're back on a motion that was made by Lynn, seconded by Pat, to reconsider the motion the specific motion as passed at the last meeting. And uh, Nina had, had clarified that the specific motion needed to be read in, which it was. Is there anybody who needs the motion repeated or has anything further to say? Otherwise, I think we'll take go to a vote. Seeing no hands going up. Uh, I think that at this point, um, I'll start with Dorothy. Aye. Bernie? I'm fine with reconsidering. Uh, Pat? Aye. Kathy? Yes. Uh, keep Bernie? Okay, I've already indicated my agreement. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Bob, then. I'm... Uh, yeah, I support it. Jane? Jenny? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm in support. Okay, I'm in support and Lynn? I'm in support. Okay, so the motion passes unanimously with three members. Uh, Lynn, I'm gonna uh, return to you as to whether you wanna make a new motion and then we'll have discussion. And uh, I think Kathy was essentially asking to be recognized then. Okay, so the new motion is very similar to the previous motion. It adds, uh, it has some grammatical changes, but it adds a component, two components. One is evaluation and the other one is looking forward to FY23 funding. So um, the motion is to recommend to the town council that it direct the town manager to seek funds to fill eight community responder positions and report back to the town council and residents of Amherst no later than January 31st, 2022 about how he plans to implement and evaluate the program and assure that funding can continue in FY23. Okay, is there a second to that motion? Second, DeAngelis. <laughs> okay, thank you. Pat. Somebody else take this on, please. <laughs> Blow on the trigger, Pat. I put my hand up on mute. Okay, I'll wait. I have on the next one. Okay, okay. Uh, 
I promised uh, Kathy that she could be the first to speak if she wished. I wondered if I could speak to my motion. You may speak to your motion, of course. The first change, the they to it is grammatical. The second change I explained above is not necessary. Uh, the reporting back to the town council and residents of Amherst no later than January 31st is not a change. I, instead of word, using the word accomplish, I used the word implement. I added evaluate the program because I think we're all very interested in how the program will be evaluated over time and assure that funding can continue in FY23. And that is something else I took away from the meeting last week. That's all I care to say. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Kathy, did you have something? Yeah, yeah. So it's a concern I had last time around. Um, this is a big improvement. Um, does this say uh, that the target is eight no matter what? Or can he come back and say, I've got, I think I found a way for at least two years to fill six. And we think six could with, you know, with the experience and what we, so it's not clear to me. Um, it's not clear to me that we need two people per shift seven days a week when I'm reading about other programs, which is how we got to the eight. Um, some programs, have figured out a way that there are certain times of day that as long as there is one person or a person on call, um, you can do it. So it's, what are we committing him, him, our town manager to is my question. So I might want to soften that. And the other seek, seek multi-year funds. I am really worried about even if we got enough to carry us into FY23, if we don't have a way to sustain the program, um, and as I think, so it, I, I would add multi, probably uh, spelling it a little differently, but you're close. Um, but, you know, and as I think people will remember last time we, we have, even with a shift of two police positions, there are three vacancies right now. So he does have the option. I understand we've, we're trying to leave it in the manager's hands to leave those to freeze and leave at least one position more vacant and not fill it so that going into FY23, we would have one less police in, inside that would help with the eight and help with the multi-year. I am really worried about committing to something that we can't carry through with. So multi-year helps me there. And then does this say the number has to be eight. So you've done up to eight. I'm much better with up to eight is the other way I would do it. You know, so that he can come back and say, including he could say, I didn't fill, we did not fill one of the vacancies. And so we have money. We can see where the money would come from both in FY22, but also FY23. So I want it understood that that's a potential direction. Um, I was uh, talked out of last time my motion, which would have been similar to what we did last year of not filling one to two of the current vacancies until January of, of 2022. And that would um, be much more um, constraining on the town manager. So that, that and so, so this allows him to make that decision doesn't say he has to, but I'm comfortable, Lynn, with what you've just in multi-year and up to eight addresses my other concern. I will stop speaking. There's a spelling in uh, multi. You wouldn't multi has got one too many eyes in it. Yeah. Um, so I guess the question that I'm going to ask before getting back to discussion um, is I have to add, um, ask the maker and the seconder of the original motion, uh, whether they would ex um, accept the amendment. So I'm fine with these amendments. And Pat? I'm not fine with both of them. I'm fine with multi-year funding 
I'm not, uh, it sounds to me, and correct me please if I'm wrong, that we'll, even with multi-year, we'll fill up to eight community responders. We may find in the second year that we need 10 or 12, I don't know. But it seems to me to support the program when it takes off, we do need two responders per shift 24-7. We're going to have to come back to discussion on this because I uh, as to what to do. Uh, I, Andy, I think you should treat Kathy's uh, thing as a, an amendment and see if there's a second for the amendment. Second amendment. Okay, Dorothy has seconded, so it's treated as an amendment and it will need to be voted on. It cannot be by agreement. So. Uh, Bernie has his hand up. Yeah, I was gonna to come to that too. I was thinking about one other issue and I'll just put it out there. Is whether when we vote, whether there can be a request to divide, to uh, treat it as two separate amendments, but I'm not gonna go there yet. Bernie. Again, my question was, is I, I think I raised the last time, does this preclude uh, purchasing services? Is this eight positions, is this saying these eight positions have to be town employees? Because I think the best, uh, my gut feeling on this is one of the best ways to go is to, uh, to, to look to see if we can purchase a service rather than make it. Um, and I'd like to, leave that option open. I'm not saying it has to be that way, but I, I'd like to leave that option open. Uh, one of the reasons why I like to see this, how he plans to implement, to me, that opens up options for implementation. Okay, thank you. So what we have right now uh, is a motion to amend, and I think I will treat it uh, as a single motion because that's the way it was offered. Uh, and there's been the request to divide, so I'm not gonna go there. Any further discussion on the motion to amend? So what we're gonna do now is come to a vote on the question of amending the motion that's on the screen to add the two um, phrases, multi-year and up to, that are in yellow presently on the, um, the screen. Andy, so, I think we're voting on the whole amend. This is, we're just- We're not. First, Lynn's substitute, and then uh, and then we'll vote on. Okay, vote no. on twelve. No, we have to vote. On, we have to know what we're voting on. We have to do the amendment first. Okay. And what happened was is that uh, the uh, seconder of the original motion did not accept it as a friendly amendment, so then it could only be offered as an amendment. So it was an amendment now that has been. Uh, a motion to amend made by Lynn and seconded. Okay, I understand. Seconded by Dorothy. So we, we would be proceeding to vote on the motion to amend. Here seeing no further requests for discussion, then I will start um, in Kathy. Yes. Lynn? Yes. Uh, Pat? No. Dorothy? Yes. Jane? Uh, yes. So the, 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 the support. Um, Bob? I support. Bernie? Supported. And I vote yes. So I think 
Did I get everybody? Did you get Bernie? Yes, I did get Bernie. I think we have everybody. And I think that the vote was on the motion to amend four in, um, in favor, one opposed, and uh, three indications of support from resident members of the committee. So we're back to the motion as it is uh, amended. So it's as it is now on the screen. And of course, um, the deletions are just showing differences from the motion that we just uh, voted to reconsider. They are not um, part of this uh, motion. The motion is what is shown without the uh, strikeout sections. Any further discussion? So, seeing no further discussion, I then uh, Dorothy. We have both multi year funds and a sure funding to FY twenty three that could be seen as contradictory. So, if we're going to keep the multi year, wouldn't we just put a period after program? I'm, I'm just, just, you know, I'm, I'm not a motion maker, so I'm just raising. I think the issue for the multi the FY23 may include some of the multi year funding, but it may also include town funds. And so what we're just saying is seek multi year, just think of that separately, but then show us early on in January, the council seated at that time. Uh, how the funding will continue into FY23. It might be multi-year, it might be, I'm you know, going to do this instead. Anything else? Then uh, let's proceed to a vote. Uh, Lynn? Yes. Bob? I support it. Kathy? Yes. Dorothy? Yes. Pat? Nope. Bernie? Support it. Uh, Jane? I support it. Can I vote yes? So I think that is everybody. So that on the motion itself, the amended motion, it's four to one, three resident members indicating their support. That is what we will report back to the council. So uh, were there any other things since going back to what the agenda was, um, is for today's meeting, the wording is, um, review of all budget recommendations. Are there any other budget recommendations that were made at the previous meeting that any member of the committee wants to revisit. Seeing none, then the last item on the agenda, we've covered all other members, is getting back to the um, topic of the auditor selection process. And I think we have a couple of minutes. Um, I did, one thing that I um, yesterday attended a meeting that was um, noticed to all of the committee in an email. It was a webinar um, conducted by the Division of Local Services of the Department of Revenue and the Office of the Inspector General about municipal audit process. And I attended, and I know that Pat attended because I saw her in the chat box. So we didn't, I haven't talked to Pat about this, but I know that we were both there. I don't know if anyone else was there, but there was a couple of things that were relevant to the auditor selection process because that actually was a significant piece of the discussion is to how auditors get selected and what uh, criteria. And there, one thing that it was discussed in 
fairly lengthy uh, presentation was a subject that we've discussed in this committee before, and that is uh, how frequently should a community go out and revisit its auditor selection? And uh, I won't try and paraphrase the whole thing because I don't know that I can do it justice, the presentation that was made, uh, but essentially the recommendation was that it doesn't have to be every year, but it should be done on a regular basis. They cited fairly uh, dramatically a very um, uh, poor example of what had happened when the town kept going to the same auditor year after year to the point that the auditor was essentially wanting to plug in the prior year's audit language by cut and paste and make extra profit on it, but it wasn't really performing the function that uh, the inspector general was thinking was the appropriate uh, function. And uh, then there was the recognition that in larger firms, that if you have rapid, uh, if you have regular turnover and staff, that you gain something from familiarity and the relationship, uh, but that it's good to have fresh eyes on it. You know, there's a lot of the criteria, the, the topics that we've discussed. And then the other thing that came up that was very relevant was um, who should make the final decision. And uh, it was pretty clear that uh, the recommendation was that uh, it not be the same individuals who provide the oversight over the finance staff that is being audited. And therefore, in a city form of government, um, it was recommended that councils make the final decision on the selection um, of an auditor. And uh, so I think those are the summaries. The other thing that I just uh, followed up on afterwards is I contacted somebody at DLS and asked this uh, straightforward question, and that is whether the PowerPoint that contains all of the information that I just provided and the recording that was made because it was a recorded webinar were gonna be made available to uh, share. And the answer was yes, that it wasn't ready to go, but that they would do that and that they would make an effort to announce its availability as soon as possible. So that those of you who might've been interested in it, but didn't get a chance, it will be an available item. And I will urge the <coughs> auditor selection committee to view it if nobody else does. Um, so I don't know, uh, Pat, you don't have to come on if you don't want, but if you have anything to add since I know you were there. Uh, no, I have nothing really. Mellons and Heath, who have been our auditors, rotated uh, auditors and things like that. So I think it's pretty standard practice with strong candidates for um, auditors. And, there, and the recommendation was rotation every five to eight years. Yes, Sean. So um, one of the reasons uh, for this agenda item was that the the charge for the RFP committee has been approved, I believe, if, um, fully approved. The one thing that we did not know if we were good to go forward with is the actual um, request for proposals document itself. You, you provided feedback. Um, we made some adjustments to the document, um, but we did want to get moving on this so that we you know, in particular, if there is a change in auditor, we want that to be soon enough in the fiscal year that there's time to transition. Um, I went through an auditor transition at the region and there's a lot of legwork. If you do switch auditors in terms of you have to code all your accounts to their new systems, you have to go through every account and classify it, you know, 10 different ways. Um, and so we wanted to do that over the summer. So I just wanted to see if this committee is comfortable I don't know if it needs a vote or not, but thumbs up on the RFQ document or the RFP document um, so that we can move forward on soliciting applications. 
I guess there's another question then that floats from that, John, is, and that is whether the council under the charter needs to uh, approve the actual RFP or if that can be delegated to the committee. And then to the committee is which committee? Yeah, and I think, um... I think if we can have it by the end of June approved so that we can um, advertise it in July and get applications by the end of August and, and do all the, the evaluating in September, I think that would be fine. So if it does have to go back to the council, if there's a way for it to go back at the end of June, um, again, I don't know the answer. I think we've gone back and forth about who approves, the, who's actually approving the contract. So um, without Paul here, I don't wanna um, talk about, I don't, want, I don't wanna weigh in more on myself on that, but, um, yeah, I don't know the answer if they have to approve the actual RFP document. Again, the charter talks about the the council establishing a process. And so um, I think that can be construed different ways. Dorothy? Uh, well, I move that we um, approve the document that was sent to us today, uh, the RFP of the audit process. Someone may want to reword that motion, but um, I did look it over. It looked so it responded to our conversations and um, I, I, I move that we go ahead. Second. A second. I think that the, it is, I need a clarification and uh, I'll turn to either Lynn or Athena on this one. But my understanding of the council rules is that we make recommendations to the council, but only the council can vote to approve. The, the confusing things for me while Athena is looking at that, maybe she wants to find the charge for the committee is, we approve the charge for the committee. We appoint, I appointed the members to the committee. Uh, and I believe now we need to look at whether or not the committee needs to approve the RFP or it has to go all the way back to the council. I, if it does, then let's get it done and over with because on, on June 21st, uh, the council meeting will essentially be finance, finance, finance. Um, Andy, the, the RFP committee charge doesn't include approval of the RFP itself. It, it only includes it, that it shall receive applications from the from the qualified auditing firms and evaluate them. The motion from the council was to refer the procedures for selection of the audit firm to the finance committee. Um, so I think it probably makes sense to recommend that the council approve the RFP, like uh, Dorothy moved. It's cleaner. So I think we, I think we could probably motion. do that. Right. right, we could maybe add that to consent. I think so. So the motion should be uh, to recommend to the council approval of the RFP. If Dorothy is willing, I am willing to have that be the motion. Dorothy? I am willing. Okay. Anything else in discussion? Yes, I just want to mention that I've also spoken with the town manager and uh, with Andy after the seminar he and Pat attended, which I want to thank you both for doing that. Um, he is perfectly fine if the uh, council who ultimately is the body that the audit is done for uh, approves the selection of the auditor. Uh, we will use the same kind of criteria that the town does in doing any kind of procurement. I know Andy Delaney is in the audience. Um, and um, so, but it is really the council that should approve it ultimately. So the way the charge is read, I'm just to read it real quickly again, because I also have it on my uh, right here, but I can't share it with you. The audit RFP review committee will receive applications from qualified auditing firms, evaluate applications utilizing the criteria in the RFP document and deliver evaluations to the chief procurement officer, town manager, who will consider the qualitative rankings of each firm along with their price proposals. 
uh, I think that what we're really getting at, and I don't think we need to change the charge, is that that's what the committee will will be charged to do. That it um, that then uh, the town manager will make a recommendation of a firm to choose that it will be up to the council, probably with the advice of the finance committee um, as to whether to uh, accept his recommendation. And if that is done, then it goes back to the town manager to actually enter into an, um, a, a contract because that is an executive function, not a legislative function. I agree with that. So that is the process we would be moving towards. So what we are doing right now in the motion that is on the uh, floor is um, just that we are recommending to the council that it um, authorize the issuance of the request for proposals um, as has been submitted to this committee. So any other discussion? If not, I'm gonna to proceed to a vote and, uh, and we can finish up our business for the day, I think pretty much. Uh, Kathy? Yes. Bob? I support it. Dorothy? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Bernie? I support it. Uh, Pat? Aye. Aye. Jane? I support. And I vote yes. So it's this vote is unanimous um, with support of th all three resident members of the committee. So um, the only business uh, that I hadn't anticipated uh, when the uh, set out it's not really a matter that requires discussion uh, but uh, the report that we sent to the committee did not include um, anything on the uh, general government sections and to simplify the process I was going to just take the uh, meeting uh, I review the meeting I've been sent the link to the meeting by Athena, and I will write a brief report on the general government sections. And uh, Sean? Um, one thing that was raised on Monday by Councillor Brewer was she had submitted some questions around um, the town council section of the budget and school committee stipends. And I had provided you know some draft responses to those to the finance committee. So. Um, I think she had indicated she wanted to see those in the in the report on general government. Um, so I'll I'll re forward the, my responses on those because we didn't discuss them at a meeting. They were just I sent them electronically. Um, so I'll re forward those responses to you, Andy. I can I can write something up for you, Andy. I was uh, I got very far behind because of chasing children, but um, I have notes, and that was the section that I reviewed. So I'll I can get something out to you later today. Okay, well, I would appreciate it, but uh, whatever works for you, Jane, I understand uh, having three young kids puts you in a category that certainly respect. Um, but thank you. Kathy? Yeah, I, Sean, I, I had a few thoughts as I went through the budget book in terms of formatting, and I didn't know... Um, whether, and Andy, I mentioned one or two to you, one, well, two things. One, it's not indexed, so I would find it, page numbers very useful so I could find things. I've got little sticky notes everywhere, but um, in two years ago, each department showed the health insurance costs of the, of the department, so you could see both the wage, um, and last year it didn't. So the very first one of these budget books, the inaugural one had it, but then it didn't. But I, the question, the larger question is, would you want individual thoughts on that just sent to you? Do you want us to somehow collect the thoughts and send it to you as a group? 
piece. And then you're not going to do this again until <laughs> 10 months from now or whatever, you know. Um, so and and I've been looking at some other town budget books. And I think the other thing I mentioned is in at least one town that you you segue into a capital part of the, the budget book. So you can see you can see you don't have to go to two different documents to see what the line for capital is spending on. It doesn't have as robust a capital improvement program, but there were just some thoughts I had um, on a um, for for those of us who actually use this and use it as a reference, not trying to figure out where's the other part of it. Um, right. Yeah, no, my thoughts are maybe that's something we could schedule for September and we could do, um, you know, we could discuss it, but also kind of solicit feedback from the full council so it all kind of comes at once. Um, and then we can all discuss the changes and just make sure everyone's supportive of them. Um, yeah, because I've heard little things from other people as well that we could uh, do better or add. So um, if, if you're okay with it, I think September would be yeah. a good time to kind of discuss all that so we can prepare for the next year. So I thought it's not helpful to get them bits and drabs. And, right. and those are things that just jumped out at me. There may be others as I, as I work my way through it. Um, mm -hmm. And then my only other question when we do that in September is for you to see whether anyone has gone on engage Amherst to you. You went to great effort to make it more animated and more sectional, and I I think that took a lot of staff yours and other staff time. If if people aren't using it, it, it would be a way something we could discuss in September. You know. Yeah. 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 No, we, we certainly haven't gotten a lot of questions on engage Amherst. I haven't actually looked at the um, at the analytics behind the scene that show you how many people have gone to it. Um, but no, that's not another thing we could bring the sort of report on how much, how many people went through that site. It wasn't, I mean, setting the website up was a little bit of work, uh, mostly from Brianna, um, but there haven't been many questions on it. So there hasn't been a lot of work to maintain it. Um, so yeah, but we can bring more information on that. It was the first year too. Maybe if we, the more we sort of normalize that online function for asking questions, it'll, it might be used more because um, it is a really nice tool to kind of catalog all the questions that come in. So I did, I do wish it was used a little bit more this year to, sub, to submit questions on the budget. And I'm just really thinking of staff time and pressures on you, you all times that, you know, I, I worked for a foundation that set up an interactive feature at great cost. And when we asked how many people had used it, it turned out almost no one had ever used it and they were just yeah we're not going to you know, do any more for up. we're not going to do any more for building project tools we're done with the four building project tools right? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. more, no more of those okay thank you okay yeah as far as the issue that uh Melissa Brewer brought up about the uh one section on town council that includes um stipends for school committee and whether that confuses um readers and makes the town council expense look higher than it is because it includes something that's clearly not town council. I think that's a subject for next year's presentation. Uh, we might put it, uh, you have Jane and I put an explanation into the report we submit to the council just so that it's there for the record, but um, any change is future, not past. So duly noted for that purpose. Anything else that people would like to raise under business not anticipated? Seeing none, I think that uh, we're at the end of the meeting. Um, I don't have um, another meeting date that's firm. Uh, Sean, had you uh, an agenda that you need us to consider for next no i don't think we have anything right now we'll let you know there um there is one hand in the in the attendees um list i don't know okay i will uh thank you for pointing that out because it, it is public comment before but i always willing to go back so um let me uh have tony cunningham uh brought along so that she can uh give whatever comment Hello, thank you. Uh, yeah, public comment was listed as the uh, item eight on the agenda for today. 
Um, so my name is Tony Cunningham. I live in North Amherst, and I'd like to express my disappointment with the motion regarding the funding of CRESS and the other recommendations of the CSWG. It is my belief that it is the council's responsibility to give direction on how to fully fund the program and not something that should be put on the shoulders of the town manager. I believe this direction should include not filling the vacant police officer positions to ensure there is sufficient funding for the CRESS program and the other CSWG recommendations, both in FY22 and 23. Directing the town manager to find funds from grants not yet identified jeopardizes a successful launch of the program and reduces its chances of success in the future. A braver and bolder step would be to recognize what was made clear in the CSWG and 7Gen report that illustrated the over-policing of communities of color in Amherst. Reducing this type of over-policing would reduce the need for 48 sworn officers, allowing for that funding to secure a successful CRESS program. Also, with the police department tracking at 63% at the end of the third quarter, there may well be funds available there too that could be shifted to CRESS for next year. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tony. Uh, and I appreciate you raising your hand at the point that you did uh, because you may have come on after we did the first round of uh, public, public comments. So thank you. Uh, I think that we're, as the comment, we, we try and make sure that we hear all public comments. We don't can't always respond to public comment. Um, Sean. Oh, the one thing I'll just add is um, to the commenter's point, we did, so there is a shift of some of that. Uh, we talked about the 61% the in, the, in the third quarter report. So some of that has been shifted down to the, um, the community responder program. That's the 100 and I think it's 170, well, 130,000 now of this year's budget that was shifted um, to, to the community responder program. Which is the two the two vacant positions that we've discussed in the past? So, um, seeing no other requests from the committee for any unanticipated business, I think it's time to bring us to a close. Thank you very much, and uh, I consider that we're adjourned at four thirty. Thank you. And Thank uh, you. we will let you know when there's Bye, next everybody. Meeting. Bye. Bye.